What's up guys? So UFC 248 just wrapped up. It was overall a very good night of fights. There was a lot of good fights. One of the best fights of all time occurred on this card. One of the most interesting, I guess, chess matches also happened on this card. Some really good knockouts. But I think a lot of people are going to be leaving this car with a bad taste in their mouth, maybe because they didn't like the way the main event went. So Izzy won by decision, 248-47s and 149-46, and a very weird fight to score. Now, a lot of people may have thought that this was going to be some explosive fight, but when you look at it in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense of why this fight went the way it did. They're both counter-strikers, mostly. Yuel doesn't look like a counter-striker, but he usually creates damage from his counter-shots, from his flying knee to Chris Wyman, to him dropping Robert Whitaker in their second fight. It's usually the way he creates a lot of damage, and Israel Adesanya, he's going to want to be the counter-striker when he fights someone like Yoel Romero, who's very explosive, right? He doesn't want to cover too much range on such a powerful fighter, right? And that's what he did in the first round, because it was so slow. You saw Izzy confused a bit. For sure, he did not expect Romero to walk in the center of the cage and station himself for like two minutes. He didn't even move for like two minutes straight, and it threw Izzy off. Now it forces Israel Adesanya to be the one that has to begin the dance. He has to lead the dance, which is something he does not want to do against Romero, right? Especially with Romero, hands up to his head, feet planted to the ground, and just looking at him, right? Because what is he going to do that's really going to trick you all Romero right there and then? It's extremely dangerous, so Adesanya had to take a cautious approach. He tried to cover the distance a little bit because of the confusion, and he got caught by a big left overhand. I'm pretty surprised, you know, you gotta give Izzy some credit. He took the left overhand really well, and he said from there he knew he could take Romero's power, but still, he was evading those power shots the entire fight. Whenever Romero decided to explode, that's when he tried to do. Now, what this does to Romero is, because Izzy's also not engaging that much, Romero doesn't see his counter shots either, right? So they're pretty much at a standstill facing off with each other for most of the fight. And this is why at the end of the fight, they were both very upset with their opponent when they should be more upset with themselves, right? If they're were, if they upset about their opponent not engaging them, that's smart on their opponent's part, right? Pretend you're fighting someone. If they're mad at you because you didn't engage him and he's trying to counter you, that's good on you, right? You should have yourself to blame more than your opponent. Your opponent did the right thing because he didn't fall into your counter shots that you wanted. Ultimately, Romero lost the fight, so he should be blaming himself a lot more than Izzy should be blaming himself for losing the fight. But honestly, the way I scored it, I thought Romero won very slightly. I thought he clearly won the first two rounds, and then I gave him the fifth round. Now, I see a lot of people saying that Izzy got the third, fourth, and fifth, which I can also see as well because of leg kicking damage. I haven't seen Romero's leg get beat up that badly ever, and it was definitely very effective. So I can see Izzy winning through the light kicks, but the first one was obviously Yuval Romero's, right? He landed that big left overhand and he landed that switch right kick to the body, which sent Adesanya back really far. And in the second round, he landed, I think, another left overhand when he actually blitzed forward. And a lot of people will say, but how can you win that, right? It should be a 10-10 round. Here's the thing. A lot of people, I don't understand, they still don't know the rules. It's almost impossible to have a 10-10 round. It's almost impossible. Don't even think about 10-10 rounds. I don't agree with it. I think there should be 10-10 rounds, but there aren't. There just aren't, because that's the way the rules are set up. Pretend all the damage in a round is equal, and you land one more strike. Let's say your opponent lands three on you, you land four on them. Equal damage. You win the round. That's how detailed it is, right? You cannot have a 10-10 round. It's almost impossible. And even on the broadcast from Rogan to DC, they seem to not to understand this as well, as they were calling the first round to be a 10-10 when it can't. You all remember obviously won that round because he landed the biggest shot. He didn't even need the round kick to win that round, right? He landed, what, three strikes in that round compared to Adesanya's four? And one of those strikes from Romero, that left overhand or even the body kick, were enough to win the round. He didn't even need to land anything else to win it. And that's just how the rules are. I don't agree with them, obviously. Personally, if I were to score this fight, I would score it a draw. But we pretty much can't because there were no 10-8 rounds. And there were a couple other really frustrating things. One big one was the referee, Dan Mergliata. He was asserting himself a little bit too much. I understand that tell the fighters to fight more, which is actually part of the rules. The ref usually has to do that. I don't like that rule at all because sometimes fights are chess matches. Obviously, you don't want to see two fighters just staring at each other, not even throwing anything like Lewis versus Ngannou. That wasn't really a chess match. That was pretty much one fighter intimidated from their last fight, just did not let his hands go, and he admitted to that after that. This was more of a chess match. This was two counter strikers facing against each other. One of them is too dangerous to get in close, and one is too dangerous because he's so long and precise. And they're just trying to figure it out how to get in on each other. And when Dan Mergliata asserted himself and told them both, you guys have to fight so the judges can score what you're doing. That was so wrong because 
it threw off Romero's game plan. That was after the second round, I believe, right? So the two rounds, I think that Romero won. Right after, Dan Mergliano pretty much told him what you're doing is not getting scored by the judges. That is so wrong because he obviously did get scored by the judges. Those did get scored. So he's wrong. He potentially threw off Romero's game plan and threw off what he was trying to do and forced him to engage a little bit more, which makes him fight Israel Adesanya's game because Izzy wasn't really the one moving forward that much after that happened. Before that happened, Romero was forcing Izzy to engage a little bit more because he was sitting back. After, Izzy had the benefit of Dan Mergliata telling both of them they got to do something and Romero was the one that took that advice a little bit more and started engaging. While, Ad while Adesanya went back to kind of his counter-striking ways, sniping ways, but the fight was still not as active as Dan Mergliata wanted it to be. And the other big thing was what he did against Israel Adesanya. So Izzy, of course, he poked Romero in the eye and that was pretty bad. But then he started hand fighting with Romero. He opened his hands up, but he had his hand on Romero's hand, on his lead hand to trap it, right? It wasn't in front of Romero's face. It was on his hand. And Dan Mergliata told him to close your hands, and he did. That's so wrong again. That's so foul. That's a technique. So the rules are pretty much saying you can't hand fight with the opponent anymore from a distance. You can't hand fight in the striking. I understand if they're lingering their hands in front of the opponent's face and like pawing at them. That's why eye poke should be an automatic point deduction because it tells fighters they can never put their hands in front of the opponent like that when their fingers are extended. But when they're hand fighting and trapping hands, that should not be warned because hand fighting is something that Adesanya benefits from very much. And it's a legit technique that a lot of long fighters use without poking the opponent in the eye. All in all, I think it was pretty bad refing from Dan Mergliata, telling them this is a fight and all this sort of stuff, pretty much playing it into the crowd. I understand he has to tell him to be more active, but the way he was saying it, the way he was getting to the fighters, potentially changing their game plan, which is not right in my opinion. And now the other thing is the audience, man. I've said it a couple times in the past, and I know a lot of people agree. Some of the American audiences, there's a core spots where the audience is pretty educated and can appreciate maybe a slower, more technical fight rather than the blood and glory war that they all want. This audience was pretty annoying with that. I understand coming off the co-main event, it was such a war. Going right into the main event, they start booing immediately. They want to see something relatively equal. But even still, man, for the entire fight, you can't appreciate a chess match. You don't have to, obviously. A lot of people have different tastes in fights. Some people want to see the guts and glory fights, the wars. And some people actually appreciate some of those chess matches, the slower technical battles where it keeps you on edge. Personally, I like both. But part of me really wanted this fight to be in like Saudi Arabia or Europe or some Asian country. Maybe South Korea. I would say China, but not now, obviously. Because those crowds seem to be much more educated in what's going on. It seemed like a lot of people were booing because they just didn't understand what was happening. And that's pretty sad, especially because the fights usually happen over here. And maybe also it's because because the international fans, you know, Europe and Australia, sometimes I forget about Australia. Australia is probably the best audience when it comes to both excitement and education. They're very educated and they also make it like a banger, you know, they make it really fun as well. You know, so Australia, Asia, Europe, Russia, the Middle Eastern countries that we've been to, they usually have to stay up really late. So the fans of the sport are probably going to be more educated because they commit to it a little bit more. That's probably why their audiences are a little bit more educated when the fights happen. But all in all, I personally did like the fight. I like the chess match. I like to see what the fighter is going to do to expose an opening and all that sort of stuff. But ultimately, with Izzy winning, he's going to be fighting Paulo Costa next. That should be a very interesting fight. And one great thing that might be coming out of this fight is the fact that Adesanya is probably not injured at all. So he could probably fight right away. Depends where Costa's recovery is at. But ultimately, after this fight, I think a lot of people are not going to like Adesanya's chances against Costa. Seeing how cautious Izzy was and how vulnerable he was as well. But I do favor Israel Adesanya to win that fight because Costa in the past has been shown to get caught by straight shots. Jabbing defense is not that well. He got dropped by a straight right hand, I think, by Uriah Hall when he was trying to make his way in. I think it's a good fight for Adesanya. As for you all, Romero, so this is three losses in a row. All three fights potentially could have went to him. That is insane. This guy just doesn't lose decisively. Only that first one with uh, Robert Whitaker. Every other fight in the UFC, it could have went to him. He can be on a four fight win streak right now as a champion defending his belt twice. You know how crazy that is? I can see you all, Romero, maybe in the future getting a title shot because he says he wants to fight for another 10 years, so we'll see about that. He's obviously going to be very hard to beat for anybody. He showed some smarts in this fight, as well as being just as dangerous as ever before. And the fight to make next for him is against Jared Kennanier, 100%. Kenanier was supposed to fight. Opponent had to pull out. I don't know what's with the Darren Till thing. Romero only took some bumps and bruises on his leg. I think he should be back pretty quickly. And him versus Jared Kenanier should absolutely be the fight. If he beats Jared Kenanier, man, we're looking at Romero right back at 
title contention, or at least close to it. And then we go to the co main event. Zhang Weili defeats Wanda Young Jacek by split decision, two 48-47s on her side. So first starting with the scoring, this fight could have went either way. I could see either fighter winning pretty much every single round. Yuana could have won every round by a slight margin. You know, it was that close. That actually kind of contradicts itself, right? But you understand what I'm saying? Like every round could have went to either fighter. People thought that Zhang Weili is going to be too powerful. People thought Yuana was going to be too technical and too experienced. Here's the thing that completely threw me off in this fight. They fought their opponent's game for most of this fight. This fight went opposite what I thought it was going to be like. I thought Yoana was going to stick at a distance and counter and just throw a lot of jabs and push kicks and round kicks to the leg and escape. And I thought Zhang Weili, even though she is a really good counter puncher, it's going to be hard to counter such a long and fast fighter who doesn't engage that much in the close range like Yoana. So she's going to have to be a little bit more physical and march her way in defensively and find that powerful straight right hand. It was opposite. Yoana right away was getting into the close range exchanges even though she has the reach advantage, throwing combinations and trying to land with power off of her jab, right? Her jab was extended far, but then it only made her way in to land the right straight, left hook combo, and then came up with uppercuts and stuff like that and ended with a leg kick. Zhang Wei Li was a counter puncher staying at a distance throwing leg kicks. Crazy, right? That's why you can't predict MMA. Who thought this fight would have went like this? Who thought Yuana would be the one to engage? And Zhang Weili was more of the counter puncher and staying at a distance with kicks. Craziness, right? Craziness. And that's what made this fight amazing because later in the fight, after Yuana got the hematoma, she started to be more defensive and more evasive in the fight, but not intelligently so, more like panicky. And she did allude to that in the interview afterward that the swelling was really getting to her and she was just trying to find distance and space to breathe. But that swung the momentum into Zhang Wei Li's side. So you remember when Yoana started to be very effective in the southpaw stance after landing the head kick, the front kick to the face, I think at the end of the third round? She took the southpaw stance and Zhang Wei Li just couldn't find her distance. She couldn't find her timing. Her punches were starting to fall short. Her left hook was getting blocked and she was getting caught by the left hand all day. So the momentum went right onto Yuana's side and the commentators were saying, you know, Zhang Weili was getting tired, she was slowing down. Looking at hindsight, it seemed like Zhang Weili was just frustrated a little bit. Like she couldn't figure out what to do against the southpaw Yuana and it might have seemed like she was slowing down after that. But after the hematoma got pretty big, the momentum returned right to Zhang Weili's side and it looked like she never gassed out or slowed down in the first place. Just amazing fight. I mean, there was a little straight right hands from Zhang Weili that stunned Yuana. And we know Yuana has been through wars in the past from Claudia Gadea, getting dropped by her two times in their rematch, went through a war in their first fight, got knocked up by Rose Namajunas, got hurt a couple times by Jessica Andraj, went through a war with Rose in the second fight, got dominated by Valentina Shevchenko, came into this fight and took Zhang Weili's best punches. You gotta give it to Yuana. She is extremely tough. As cringe as she is sometimes, she's a true fighter, man. One of the most technical strikers we've ever seen in the sport. But Zhang Weili's right there as well. She's so powerful, man. Zhang Weili's built very well like very balanced the way she throws punches she has the ground under her with everything she does she had decent leg kicks but it was really the straight right hand and the left hook counter i mean she pretty much gave you on a facial reconstruction surgery you know what i'm saying like the power difference was so apparent. I mean, breaking her nose, stacking hematomas on top of each other, knocking the mouthpiece out of mouth, like making you want to back up with every shot. So who these fighters should be fighting next? For Zhang Wei Li, if Rose Namajunas defeats Jessica Andraj, that is obviously the fight to make next. And if Zhang Wei Li can go and defeat Rose Namajunas, which is going to be a very hard fight, she's a legend in the sport. She has defeated the three best fighters in this division back to back to back to back. Now, although I do think it's going to be a pretty tough fight, I think Yoana was supposed to be the hardest fight for Zhang Weili. Rose is very dangerous for the first two rounds. She's very hard to hit. She's very hard to track down. And she's extremely fast with legit knockout power. More power than Yoana has. And she's a far better grappler. But she does have her vulnerabilities, right? Although she's so dangerous on the offensive and as a counter striker, she has more of a vulnerability in her defense. And that is really the close range exchanges. Now, if Zhang Weili can get her way in on such a fast mobile target, stay in close, get that clinch on, Rose is going to be in big, big trouble. And the other thing is Rose does slow down sometimes, especially when she's moving backwards. In the Yoana fight, she was really the one that was moving forward on Yoana or keeping the fight in the center. But against Jessica Andrade, she started to slow down just a little bit. Against Carolina in the past, she slowed down. When you pressure her, sometimes she doesn't know how to deal with it effectively, right? She just punches with you at times. And that is not going to be good against someone as powerful as Zhang Weili. But that's the fight that has to happen next. If Jessica Andrade goes and beats Rose, maybe wait for Tatiana Suarez. Maybe you could do the Jessica Andrade rematch, I guess. I don't know. I would actually like to see that Tatiana Suarez fight. And as for Yoana Janjacek, 
she's beaten so many fighters in this division already. Nina Ansaroff would have been a really good fight. Jessica Andrade if she loses to Rose. Rose if she loses to Jessica Andrade. It's really hard to book Ioana because she's fought pretty much everybody. Now, I had a problem with ESPN Plus tonight. For a lot of the main card, it was just buffering so much and at one point even crashed on me completely. I missed the entire Neil Magny versus Li Jing Liang fight. I don't know how that fight went, but I heard Neil Magny dominated. I'm pretty sure through the grappling because I would find it very hard for Magny to dominate Jing Liang on the feet. I missed the Alex Oliveira versus Max Griffin fight for the last two rounds. I saw the first round. I heard it was a war. I heard it was a good fight. I think Max Griffin took him down a few times. I know Oliveira was throwing those uppercuts very ill-advised. Hands down, just threw his hand up right in front of his face. So it seemed like an interesting first round. But we go to Sean O'Malley defeating Jose Quinones in the first round, two minutes and two seconds. I made a breakdown of that fight going down in detail, so make sure to check that out. But Sean O'Malley is legit as it comes. He beat a very durable fighter in Jose Quinones, someone who's a bit tricky, long and tall, and did it very easily. I mean, off two years as well, that's very good mentally looking at a young fighter. Nothing discouraged him. Looked better than ever. Ever. Very powerful. He packed on some muscle. You saw the veins popping out. I know a lot of people are going to say steroids and stuff, but he physically looked bigger and powerful, and it mattered, man. When he landed that right hook counter right behind the ear and threw Quinones into the cage, they came up with the head kick and launched him into the cage, and then the uppercut that levered his head. Yeah, that's some power, man. He looked very smooth, and also, he looked like he was just getting started. He didn't throw much. A few kicks out there, but... Jose Quinones exposed himself, and how Sean O'Malley not going to just counter him for doing that? That's pretty much all it led to. I think Sean O'Malley should fight Marlon Vera, Chito, and if it's not going to be that, he should get a ranked opponent. Absolutely. He's going to be destroying these non-ranked guys beyond belief. He's going to be the next MVP. Mark Madsen defeats Austin Hubbard by 29-28 on the scorecards. Mark Madsen is very strong, so he's a silver medalist in the Olympics for Greco-Roman, and it showed, man, that upper body strength is something you should not look over, man. Yeah, you can keep your distance on him, but he somehow gets in there. Austin Hubbard was hyped to be some really good distance fighter with good angles. It didn't matter too much in the first two rounds. He got ragdolled in that first round, got thrown over. Mark Madsen looked like a young Habib Nurmagomedov, with not only some of the skill and techniques, but just the tenacity when he got a hold of him. But he started to slow down. Did not pace himself that well. He's very young in MMA. 35 years old in age but 10 and 0 in mixed martial arts and it was good experience overall because he faced a lot of adversity in that third round against a young guy in austin hubbard right hubbard's coach was demanding him you gotta get in his face you gotta throw man you can't let this guy just dictate the fight like this hubbard started going with flying knees and he caught madison with a few of those but madison ate them he has a legit chin he ate a flying knee to the face stumbled a little bit but came at hubbard right afterward and try to do what he was doing the entire fight, but he lost that round. And a big reason why he was getting caught by the left knee was he kept dipping his head to the right, which is the angle he usually likes to take when he wants to drive in for a takedown or clinch up with the opponent. It was just getting him caught, and I hope he can break those instincts, break those habits, or at least use them at the right time and get more comfortable with the striking, more defensively than offensively, like Habib Nurmagomedov, right? Habib is not the best offensive striker, but his defense is legit even if he stays on the feet with you. And his wrestling threat also works as a striking defense, slowing the striking match down just so the wrestler can figure some things out and see things a lot more clearly. That's what Mark Madsen has to really do. He should look at Habib a little bit more or train with him or something, right? Go to AK8 because there's a lot of wrestlers there that turn out to be decent enough strikers to deal with danger strikers in the UFC. And I'm going to have to catch up with all the fights I missed. ESPN Plus, man. I don't know. Did any of you guys have problems with it? It literally crashed on me a few times tonight to the point where, like, I couldn't get it to work. I was wasting my time. We're paying for that. So I expect high quality, good, stable streaming. So I hope you guys enjoy this. I hope you guys enjoy the card. I am going to make a breakdown of the Izzy vs. Romero fight. I'm going to analyze the chess match that it was. So be looking for that. And again, thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you guys then.